And now, it's time for another Dice Tower Review with Tom Vassell. Hey everybody, I'm Tom Vassell, and today we're taking a look at a game called Fayum. This is from Friedman Fries, which you can tell because it's a green box. Uh, <laughs> Friedman Fries is known for his love of the color green. Now, this game here from 2F is, it also starts with the word F, Fayum, which is another one of his things, but it's about... <laughs> I don't know, it's about building in ancient Egypt or something. The theme here doesn't really matter. What matters is that Friedman Fries is the designer, and Friedman Fries is an experimental designer. He made a game once called 504, which had 504 different ways to play it. Sometimes his experiments result in a game that everyone loves. Power Grid is a good example of that. Sometimes, like 504, there's something that everyone kind of applauds and says that's a neat idea, but nobody really plays anymore. So what kind of game is this? This game has some concepts that are you know, interesting and compared to other games, but also has a different feel. It is a hand building game. We're gonna have a hand of cards and playing these cards and then picking them back up and playing them again. And that's a mechanism I like a lot. So let's see how this one does it. This is the way the board looks at the beginning of the game. Each player is going to get a handful of five cards. You have three farmers, a settlement, and two roads. And on your turn, you have one of three different actions that you can do. You can play a card and do whatever it says, putting that card in a discard pile in front of you. Or you can buy a card. The cards have different costs here. You can only buy four these first four cards here. If there's a discount token on it, this one, for example, normally costs three. But if you discount token, I just remove that, and I would pay two money, adding that card to my hand. Before I go any farther, we should talk a little bit about the cards here. The cards in this game are numbered, and there's many, many cards in the game. And you notice this is 8, 12, 20, 22. Whenever you draw new cards from the deck and put them in a row, so let's say, for example, I bought a card and I'm going to replace it with 112. 112 is going to go to the very end of the row and shuffle other cards in. So if I bought card 12 and I drew 112, 112 is going to go over here and all the other cards are going to slide over. So now 22 and 44 are here. But only these four cards are ever able to be bought. But cards are going to be constantly moved into this area. As the game goes by, you're going to have some yellow cards that are in the deck that are going to be worth points and also trigger the end of the game when they show up. So again, your actions are playing a card, buying a card, or the third action, which is administration. When you do administration, you'll count the number of cards still in your hand, and you'll get three dollars or three money minus the number of cards you have. So if you have no cards left in your hand, you get three. Also, if there are workers on the board, and there's going to be workers on the board, you can pull these workers off, up to two of them off the board, and get a dollar of money for each one. You can then draw the top three cards of your stack in front of you into your hand. So as you play cards, you have to think about the order because you're only going to get the top three back in your hand. Now you can take more cards, but you have to pay one money for each card that you take back in your hand. So if you have a lot of money, you can pick up your whole hand again. And then you're also going to replace a couple cards in the market. Uh, these discount tokens will come back on some of the cards that are still there, and you keep going. And this happens until the game ends with certain yellow cards coming out. Now, what is going on here, though? And it's all about the playing of the cards. Many of the cards are pretty simple. So, for example, the starting card everybody has is a farmer. The first farmer you can put anywhere. I could put a farmer here. This, by putting a farmer there, I'm going to get a resource of that space. So here we have grapes, here we have grain, and over here we have stone. The first one you can put anywhere. After that, you just put them adjacent to a farmer that's already on the board. If there's a crocodile in that space, you drain the land, remove the crocodile, and you also get uh, one money. So that's one of the main actions that you will start the game with. But after that, you're going to do all sorts of things. You might want to build roads. That card is a card that lets you build up the two roads. Roads cost a resource, and it's one of the two resources of where that road's connected to. So if I build a road here, for example, I could pay one grape or one stone. 
or you'll build settlements on boards. Settlements have to be in settled areas where they're basically clear, but to build a settlement, you're going to pay one of each resource of the main resources, which is grain, grapes, and stone, and then you get three points and three money. So getting points is kind of the focus of this game, and as time goes by, you're going to get all kinds of cards that give you points. This lets you take a farm piece and put it on a board that has a road connected to it. It's going to cost one grape and one stone. Anything in red is what something costs. And then the rewards, I get three grain and I get three points. Uh, here, for example, this is a very similar thing, but it's a quarry. So it will give me three points and four stone. Sometimes they just give you things, like the senior supplier here. If I put a person on a settlement on the board, I get three of these resources. I can pick which resources I want to get. And there's going to be cards that, you know, the, the bigger numbers will give more points. Here's a banquet. Put him on a spot, pay all this, $6 plus these three food resources, and get eight points. So that's kind of the focus of the game. There are a lot of different cards in this game. And there's a book that explains each of them to you, and they're all going to do various things. There is a lot of wooden pieces in this game, and some of them are very specific. Like this is the Grand Bridge, as opposed to the bridge. And these bridges are like roads, but they go across the river. You have three basic resources, stone, wheat, and grapes. Then there's fish, and then there's even these tulips, which are a wild resource if you get them. There are these, which could be anything from a farm to a quarry. There are people, there are settlements, there are stones that go in things, there are expansions. There are, you can put this in something and it's a city. So there's all kinds of things. The wooden pieces are fine, but it is a little weird to me to have these in the game because functionally they're not really that different other than these guys and the resources, but it just, you're putting them out on the board. There's also crocodiles everywhere and you're pulling them off. The board itself, in my opinion, is pretty ugly. Everything here just has a feel and look of something that's from the 90s of the game. And even the cards, they're okay. I mean, it's, hey, Red means pay, green means get. But you're still probably going to have to look up each card and the fact that there's a book here. And so this is going to slow down your first few games as you look up and see what every card does. After you've done it a bit, or even after you've played several cards, you'll understand how the rest of them work. So component-wise, I wish it was a prettier game. It's very functional, but that's about the best I can say. I often talk about games being strategic versus tactical, and that really matters for this game. Strat strategic games are games where you have an overall strategy, you kind of plan what you're going to be doing, you know, putting cards together, various things to get the end game results. This doesn't feel that way at all. This is more tactical where you are saying, what's on the board right now, what can I do? Yes, as time goes by, you can build up a hand of cards that hopefully match together and work together. But you don't know what cards are going to come out at any given time. You can't even really plan for your cards. Even if you have every card in the game memorized, it might be a while before that card shows up and someone else might take the card that you want. So there's that. The game has a really cool mechanism of the different cards as you rearrange them from smallest to largest. I like that a lot. It means you might possibly get a big card earlier in the game if all the cards have higher numbers. But the low cards are gonna definitely be there as they come out and slide to the bottom. This is a mechanism that is not necessarily new. Friedman Fries used it in his most popular game, Power Grid. But I like it and I would like to see this used in more games. It works really well. Now, I do have some problems with the fact that the cards have no text on them. I get why that's the way it is, but this constant have to then compare them and look at things. But my bigger problem with the game is that nothing seems to mean anything. The, you put a, like you saw those two cards I've showed you where you, you put a building here and it's a granary. You put a building here and it's a, it is a, um, a quarry. That one doesn't feel like that, and the other doesn't feel like a quarry. It, there's so many different pieces in this game, but functionally they're the same thing. If I put this piece here, or if I put this piece here, the only reason all those different pieces exist is because there is limited amounts of them, so if you run out of certain pieces, that card is no longer useful to you. And even that's kind of rare, unless a lot of people buy cards that put out the same type of pieces. So it's neat, I guess, that there's all these pieces, but sorting them out, putting them together, 
And then the fact that they kind of all do the same thing, I didn't find that to be that interesting. And, and he tracked it a bit, having to look up the cards all the time, seeing what the cards did. And yet, I still like the game. Now, I like it as an amusing game that's fun to play, and I'll gladly play it. And I don't know that I'll ever be good at Fayum because you don't know what order the cards are going to come out in. I might get a couple cool cards that work together. But I like the idea of play a card, buy a card, or do that administration thing. And administration changes everything because it's a way to get a little bit of money for yourself. It's a way to pick up cards. And the idea that you only pick up your top three cards is a very clever one. You want to play your worst cards first, get them out of the way, use them, then play your, your best three cards after that, then pick those three cards up. Sure, after a while, money flows a little bit more freely in the game, and you can pick up five, six cards, which means you do administration less. But that, that, the flow of the game is not a long thing. It's play a card, buy a card, do the administration. And, and it moves like that. Now, it will move faster, again, once you know what the cards do. That really will, your first game of this is going to be a bit of a crawl because of that. But once you get moving along, it's entertaining. In this game, I'm like, oh, this one lets me sacrifice crocodiles to get some points. Fantastic. This one lets me uh, build, you know, has a feast and so I can get a lot of food from here, spend it here to get points. And I think that's an interesting idea. The game also has a staggered endpoint. Certain cards come out, I'll be like, ooh, that's 10, 10 points. I'll take that card, but then I'm out of the game and you keep playing until you basically run out of cards. Because once there's a certain number of cards out there, nobody can take the administration action anymore. So you're just all playing out your cards, but maybe buying a card or two, and then you finish out the game. So there'll be a slight difference of ending, but we're talking a few minutes apart. It's entertaining. It's interesting. I do wonder if anyone is going to talk about it in a year, let alone farther down the line than that. And like I said, it doesn't look, the box doesn't look interesting. The game doesn't look interesting. I don't think the whole thing comes together net, you know, in a way that you're like, wow, I want to play this. And yet, I have fun. He definitely left uh, spaces between the numbers, so you'll be able to throw in more expansion cards as time goes by. And the, it, it flows in a really smooth way. And it might not be a great looker, but the game plays well. Again, it feels like an experimental interesting science experiment of a game, then that's, again, what Friedman Fries is known for. This one, I think, works. I don't think it will be a popular game, but I think it's one that a lot of people will enjoy, especially at, at the beginning, as there's a strong sense of discovery. And I wonder how that will balance out after many games, but for those first five, six, seven games, I think you'll have a very entertaining time, as I did. I'm Tom Vassell. You've been watching The Dice Tower as we talk about Fayum. Dice Tower Judgment approved.